worshiping here for, I don't know, maybe 25 years. Um, and I'm currently the chairman of the Board of Trustees. I'd like to welcome you in the name of Christ, who is our true one redeemer. Um, we're an open, welcoming faith community, walking in the way of Jesus and committed to place. We do believe in the power of prayer here. Um, if you have something or someone for, that you would like us to hold up in prayer during our prayers of the people, we invite you to fill out one of the blue cards and bring it down to the basket during the opening hymn. Uh, share your joy and concern on the one side. If you would like that person to receive a letter from us telling them that we've held them up in prayer, uh, fill out the address on the back if, if you don't believe we have the address for that person. Uh, we do get quite a few people um, letting us know that they've received our letters and uh, that it's a, a help to them to know that we held them up during our, during our time of prayer. Also, it is helpful for us to know that you're here and worshiping with us today, so you'll find red books uh, along the center aisle. If you'll fill those out, give us whatever information you'd like to share with us, pass them out to the outside and back and get to know maybe who's seated with you. Um, I think that's all of the logistics, so uh, just a quick moment of prayer. Uh, Lord, we're thankful for the time we have together. We're thankful that we can worship in your name, and we ask you to be with us during the service today. All right, I think we're ready for our first hymn, um, which is Amazing Grace, uh, one of the great ones, uh, number 378 in the red hymnal. The, find it in your red hymnal, and the words will also be on the screen behind me. Good morning. My name is Mark, pastor here. Welcome. Glad you're here. I have something I want to share with the children, and they're going to need to see the screen. I saw, from, there was, there's two of them. There, there's one. You can come on down. You're going to need to see the screen. This is, um, it's a monster story. So, um, well, I, I, I don't know if it's going to be scary. So, do you know who, Henry, do you know who this is? Anybody, who is this? Pinocchio. It's Pinocchio. It's Pinocchio. And the thing about Pinocchio, like that. Why does Pinocchio's nose grow? Every time Pinocchio tells a lie, his nose grows. This is not a story about Pinocchio. 
This is a different story, but it has a similar theme. This is the story of Freddy and the I'm monster. Freddy and the I'm monster. Give you the next slide, please. Freddy and Frilla. These are two friends of mine. And Frilla, why do you suppose her name is Frilla? Right, I see people motioning. It's because of her hair. People just call her Frilla because her hair is sort of frilly. So this is a story of Freddy. Now let me tell you something about Freddy and Frilla. They're smart. They're brother and sister. Freddy's um, a year or two older. They're smart. They're good at sports. Frilla is better at some sports than Freddy. Freddy is better at some things than Frilla. But they're both, they do well in school. They're, they're cool kids. All right, next slide, please. So Freddy loves to play football. He loves to play hockey. He loves to play baseball. He loves to play basketball. He loves to play any sport. But he also likes to play games inside. He likes to play checkers. He likes card games. He loves to play Monopoly, etc., etc. Next slide, please. He they love to go to the playground. Next slide, please. And on the playground, Frilla will run up and down the slide, and Freddy will do pull-ups and chin-ups. This is my life goal, to do one legitimate pull-up before I die. I just want to do one legitimate, not a chin-up, I'm talking pull-up, one real one before I die. Anyway, so they love to go to the playground and do stuff. Next slide, please. What were you, were you going to say something? You could do one? I bet you could. Well, one day they were talking. Wait a minute. Wait just a minute. What did you just say? It's easy? A pull-up? Who's your... A Abigail, right? Who's your trainer? You can do... I wish we had a bar right here. I would love to see you do it. It's, oh, I'm humbled. Anyway, okay, moving along. So Freddie and Frilla were talking one day, and Freddie said, I'm strong. I'm strong. And Frilla, I, well, I know. That's what it's there for. And, and so Frilla said, yeah, that's true. And then Freddie said, I run fast. It's true. Freddie can run pretty fast. Next thing he said was, I can throw far. And Frilla thought, what's well, true? He, he, he can. He can throw very far. And then he said this. What did he say? I always win. Next slide. You might have to hit it twice. Now Frilla was listening and thought, wait a minute. <laughs> no, she didn't think I always win. That's not what she was thinking. She thought she was a little bit, she, she was a little taken aback that her brother thought that he always wins. Next slide. Then she started listening more closely and he was saying, I'm better than, I'm better than, I'm better than. Timmy, I'm better than Ginny. I run faster than Joey. He started naming people's names, saying all the people he was better than. He kept saying, I'm, I'm. But he didn't notice something was happening, and she did notice it. Every time he said, I'm, he got bigger. He started to get, you know how Pinocchio's nose got longer when he lied? Well, Freddie started just getting bigger. Next slide, please. He had been infected by the I'm monster, and he didn't even know it. This insidious monster that can come in the night or at breakfast. Oh, you don't think it's true, huh? Next slide, please. He kept saying, I'm, I'm, I'm. Next slide, please. Next slide. Oh, wait, I missed one. Go back. Go back. Go back. Go forward. Go forward. 
go forward. It's not there. Okay. So he kept getting bigger and bigger. And he said, I'm going down to the baseball field and I'm going to play baseball. Next slide. He said, I run the fastest. Next slide. I hit the ball the farthest. Now, what did you notice? What happened to him between that slide and the previous one? So let's go back one. Go forward one. What's happening? He got bigger. Oh, here's the slide. There it is. He kept saying, I, 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 and he kept getting bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. Well, finally, next slide. It was getting late in the day, and he said, I'm hungry. And so he said, I'm going to go home and have supper. So he decided, I'm going to go home. When he got home, he was so big, he couldn't get in the house. He had spent so much time saying, I'm the best, I'm the winner, I'm better than you, I'm better than you, I'm be I want this, I want that, I want this, I don't want to share, I'm not going to share, I'm not going to pick up my room, I'm not going to eat what mom or dad or grandma or grandpa's made for, for, for meals, I, I, I. He'd gotten so big, Frilla came out and looked up and she went, Freddie, what are you going to do? Well, Freddie, he began to cry because if he couldn't get into the house, he couldn't go to his, couldn't, couldn't sleep in his bed. He couldn't watch TV in the living room. And so, next slide. Frilla said to him, Freddie, God didn't make just you. Then she said, God made everyone. And then she said this. You aren't better than anybody else. You do some things really well, but so does everybody else. You don't have to be first. You don't have to be the best. You don't have to have your way. You can share. You can... God made everybody. Next slide. Freddie began to think about this. And the more he thought about it, the shorter he got, until finally, he was right-sized, and the I'm monster left, at least for now. And so, the moral of the story, if you don't want to get infected by the I'm monster, you need to love and respect everybody as much as you do yourself. Jesus teaches that. It's in our Bible. It, we read that in a lot of places, right? Love everyone and respect everyone as much as you love yourself. Now, Abigail, have you ever been infected by the I'm monster? I like you. I want to see that pull up. Let's pray together. God, thank you that you love everyone. And help us to remember today the next time we say I, help us to remember this message and to be careful and to be prayerful that we don't ever think that I am better or the best, but that you love all your children. Some of us do things better than others, and we're grateful for that. And we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, you can go to Sunday school or wherever you're headed. Thanks. What are you what are you gonna remember today? A lot. Watch out. Watch out for the I'm monster. Watch out for the I'm monster. Good luck with this. Happy Diwali. I'm sure you know that today is Diwali. You probably know this. More than one billion people are celebrating it today. So you probably know somebody. That's a lot of the earth. So if you don't know what Diwali is, it's 
a celebration of light. It is a Hindu celebration of light and of goodness overcoming evil and darkness. It's basically Easter and Christmas rolled into one. So let's celebrate with them, with the light that we know and are excited about. Let's sing some hymns of light. If I remember which way the pointer goes. We're going to start with this little light of mine. The words will all be on the screen. We're going to do one verse of each of these hymns. Um, join me. And I told him to do the good melody. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This little light of mine, I'm going to let it shine. This, uh, this next one, I, I know. This is for Scott, who asks that this be in every hymn sing, but it's thematically appropriate.
It's 2172. Do you want to look? Yeah, okay. You should just look at the music. Come live in the light. Shine with the joy. For the kingdom to live in the freedom of the city of God, we are called to act with justice, we are called to love tenderly, we are called to serve one another. And to wrap it up, Brother Glenn has a song for us. Yes, yes, the song is called, I Will Trust in the Lord. It's real, real easy. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. Father, I stretch my hands to thee, no other help I know. If thou withdraw yourself from me, Shall I go? Now the easy part, you all know it now. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. I will trust. trust in the Lord till I die. A sister, will you trust in the Lord? Sister, will you trust in the Lord? A sister, will you trust in the Lord until you die? A sister, will you trust in the Lord? Sister, will you trust in the Lord? Sister, will you trust in the Lord till you die? Everybody, I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. I will trust in the Lord. I will trust in 
the Lord. I will trust in the Lord till I die. Die. Pitch. <laughs> Thank you. Peace and blessings. Please join me in praying Psalm 65. The words will be on the screens, but if you'd prefer, you can find it on pages 789 and 790 in the red United Methodist hymnal. We will pray responsively. Praise is due to you, O God, in Zion, and to you shall vows be performed. To you who hear prayer, all flesh shall come because of their sins. When our transgressions prevail over us, you forgive them. Blessed are those whom you choose and bring near to dwell in your courts. We shall be satisfied with the goodness of your house, your holy temple. By dread deeds, you answer us with deliverance, O God of our salvation who is the hope of all the ends of the earth and of the farthest seas, who by your strength established the mountains, being girded with might, who stills the roaring seas, the roaring of their waves, the tumult of the peoples, so that those who dwell at earth's farthest bounds are afraid at your signs. You make the morning and the evening resound with joy. You visit the earth and water it. You greatly enrich it. The river of God is full of water. You provide its grain, for so you have prepared it. You water its furrows abundantly, settling its ridges, softening it with showers, and blessing its growth. You crown the year with your bounty. The tracks of your chariot drip with fatness. The pastures of the wilderness drip. The hills gird themselves with joy. The meadows clothe themselves with flocks. The valleys deck themselves with grain. They shout and sing together for joy. And now a reading from the Gospel of St. Luke. Chapter 18, verses 9 through 14. I'm reading from the New Revised Standard Version. He also told this parable to some who trusted in themselves that they were righteous and regarded others with contempt. Two men went up to the temple to pray, one a Pharisee and the other a tax collector. The Pharisee, standing by himself, was praying thus, God, I thank you that I am not like other people, thieves, rogues, adulterers, or even like this tax collector. I fast twice a week. I give a tenth of all my income. But the tax collector, standing far off, would not even look up to heaven but was beating his breast and saying, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. I tell you, this man went down to his home justified rather than the other. For all who exalt themselves will be humbled, but all who humble themselves will be exalted. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. So this quote that's 
in front of you. This is on page 153 of a book called Courage to Change. And I read this line um, at least two years ago, it might be almost three years ago now. An expectation is a premeditated resentment. Would you read that with me? An expectation is a premeditated resentment. Anytime you expect something from someone else, you're setting yourself up. When you expect someone to do what you think they should be doing, I mean, you might be right, <laughs> but if they don't do what you think they should be doing, you begin to experience resentment. The main passage Jesus is, or the main message Jesus is communicating in this parable has to do with humility as a prerequisite for righteousness. But he takes direct aim at the fact that while there are two characters in this story, only one of them is aware of the other. In fact, one of them seems to be aware of everybody else. I thank God I'm not like that one. I thank God I'm not like that one. Thank God I'm not like that one. And then if you remember the text, thank God I'm not like other people. I mean, thank God I am not like anybody else. Now, it's dangerous to psychoanalyze characters in a parable, all the more so seeing as how I really know nothing of how to do it, but you don't need extraordinary amounts of emotional savvy to detect some passive aggressive behavior here. The Pharisee stakes his claim to righteousness on top of what he perceives to be the mountain of everybody else's sin. The tax collector has his lens focused on a different set of criteria, not other people's shortcomings, but his own. There was um, an interview that I saw a part of, a man named Dennis Prager was interviewing Jordan Peterson. And in the introduction to this interview, Dennis Prager was going on and on about what a, what a, uh, how wise Jordan Peterson is. And he concluded his introduction by saying, not only is he smart, not only is he wise, he's a good man. Now the camera pans to Jordan Peterson who's sitting there and you can see he's struggling with this introduction a little bit. And so after a few seconds, he, he finally says, you know, he says, people have a great capacity for evil. I would even claim, he said, no, I would never claim to be good. That's dangerous. But, he said, I did become, at one point in my life, terrified of how terrible I can be. And that has stayed with me. I became terrified of how terrible I can be. Richard Rohr, writing of the 12-step program, notes, this is not a worthiness contest. We could say the same thing about Christianity. This is not, a, who's, who is the worthiest? That's not what this project is about. We pay lip service to the scripture where Paul says, all have sinned and fallen short of God's glory. Everybody does. That's also to say we fall short of our own potential. And any truly honest person knows this because they're reminded of it multiple times over the course of every day. <laughs> I don't need to go very far back in my history to start listing my mistakes or my sin. I have her permission to share this. A, a colleague of mine this past week, I was at the Board of Ordained Ministry uh, meeting and we were interviewing uh, people to be ordained next June at the annual conference. And we were talking about the doctrine of original sin. You know what this doctrine is? This is a doctrine that says that when our first parents, Adam and Eve, sinned in the garden, 
When they did that, all their progeny are tainted in nature, born with the need for regeneration. So in other words, before I draw my first breath, because of Adam and Eve, I've, in, I've inherited the evil of their sin. Well, this colleague said to me, said to us, you know, I really don't need Adam and Eve to be a sinner. I'm good enough all by myself at doing that. I don't need anybody else's sin. I've got more than enough of my own. In essence, that's what the tax collector is acknowledging, and that is what the Pharisee is denying. Joseph Fitzmaier is a New Testament scholar. I've quoted him before. And he says that there is a more accurate translation for the first line of our reading today. We read that Jesus told this parable to some people who trusted themselves in their own righteousness, but Joseph Fitzmaier said a better translation would be Jesus told this parable against those people, against the people who thought they were righteous. Perhaps the most powerful un unseen force in the cosmos, second only to that of the Holy Spirit, is the human ego, our own ego. And we learn this young. We sit as a young person and we say, I'm not infected by the I'm monster. But boy, grandma is here <laughs> and probably knows better. It doesn't take long for us to be infected by our own ego, our own desire. That's true for every one of us. The only reason we can single any young person out is because we all know that's true for us. It's true for me. So Jesus takes a stand against this. It's interesting that the parable mentions both the Pharisee and the tax collector, their position, right? One, the, the tax collector, is standing far off, out of, out of sight, I mean, wanting not to be seen. And the other, the Pharisee, is standing by himself so as not to be missed. Fitzmaier suggests another translation that more accurately paints the picture. The Pharisee, he writes, took a stand. It's not just the man's words. It's not just his prayer. It's the posture that he assumes, an arrogant positioning of himself, so as to be not only heard, but seen making his boast. Jesus places himself strategically and prophetically against that. The one expects nothing of God but mercy. The other not only expects but demands to be acknowledged as righteous by the Almighty. I mean, the Pharisee is saying to God, you have no choice because I'm better than all these people. You have no choice but to see how righteous I am. So much of the gospel story as Jesus tells parables or gives his teaching, it has an extreme quality to it. Jesus says, you must hate your life in order to keep it. Or you must leave your parents and your family in order to follow him. And that can leave us wondering. When Jesus says, let the dead bury the dead, that, I mean, that sounds downright insensitive. When Jesus says in Luke's gospel in the chapter previous to the one that we heard a moment ago, Jesus says, when you've done all that you have been commanded to do, simply say, we are useless servants. That sounds harsh. But you know, I wonder if one of the reasons why Jesus swings to such extremes with regard to human self-deprecation and selflessness is it because of his experience with so many people who are so arrogantly self-righteous? Does he feel, in order to make my point, 
I have to go to the other extreme. And often, pride gets all dressed up in religiosity, holy people claiming to have God's undivided attention in order to justify their own power and positions of privilege and, and to justify not relinquishing those positions. I think a healthy spirituality is neither self-abasing nor self-aggrandizing. And the turnabout in the story is the tax collector is the cultural vulture. He's the bad guy in the story, the one who takes people's money. And Jesus is flipping this on us. So now we're going to take a poll. Listen carefully. You have two people in front of you. You have the Pharisee and you have the tax collector. If you had to put money on it, gambling is against Methodist rules, so this is uh, hypothetical. Which one of these would you say has the better chance, which one is more likely to change their life? You have a tax collector who's remorseful. Well, is he going to get up tomorrow morning and go back to work and do the same thing that he's confessing about today? Or is he going to go in and, and dramatically change how he does his life and work? Is he pondering, maybe I need to quit if I'm going to be ethically, <laughs> you know, consistent? So there's him. Then there's the Pharisee, the guy who's pretty sure he's like this with God. <laughs> Which one of the two, if you had to put money on it, is most likely to change? So those of you who think, I'm not going to hold you to this, by the way, but just out of curiosity. Those of you who think, you know, <laughs> in spite of all his praying and in spite of Jesus saying that's the right prayer to pray, is he going to have to say that prayer again tomorrow night because he's not going to change? If you think that's the guy that's going to change, raise your hand. This is a risk. I know this is a risk. Okay. All right. If there will be a moment for abstention. If you think it's the Pharisee that's going to change, raise your hand. Oh, I've got a few, I have a few that are cautiously optimistic. Now, what would be great fun would be to say why. Why do you think that? How many of you are abstaining? The middle of the road people here. Neither hot nor cold. <laughs> oh, there's no place here that's absent risk. But of course, the real question is, is it worth it for anybody to put money on you? Because that's the point, isn't it? The problem with the extremes in the story is we might not relate to either individual, leaving us to assume there's nothing in it for us. But this story is for us. This story is for me and for you. And if we don't see that, if we don't see that it's for us, then we render the parable impotent. You're going to go home and you're going to assume that you have not been infected by the I'm monster. I would say, I take it a step further, one of the challenges for parents and for grandparents and for faith communities is to help young people to grow up with some sense of the power of that monster how dangerous it is, and to, and to offer to young people um, teachings, um, a God who expects from us, who wants from us something better. We have to teach that. We have to teach what, what the light is. Regardless of our religious tradition, we owe it to our young people to help them to know this basic truth, this essential truth that we are all of us children of God. Richard Rohr says that people of faith have spent more time debating and arguing about whose God is right 
than they've spent actually worshiping the God of us all. So then the next question, and the one I want to leave us with, what do you do to work the program? Because this parable is for us. It's for you and it's for me. And so what am I going to do so that if you put money on me and the potential that I have for transformation, what do I have to do? How do I have to be? How do I have to listen? What calm needs to come into my soul so that I can know the love of God and the peace of God, those fruits of the Spirit, the joy of God, the patience of God? What are you going to do? How are you going to be when worship is over this morning that adjusts the course? I think that our faith communities, our churches, and our synagogues, and our mosques, and our temples, I think God wants for us to be salt in the world and to be light in the world, not just individually, but collectively. This parable isn't just for me or for you. This parable is for us. Let's pray together. It is great good news, God, to be aware of this basic fact that regardless of what we might think about the doctrine of original sin, the scripture also tells us we are created in your image. And so there is something inherently miraculous about each and every one of us. And if our scriptures have any truth to them, then we discover that Jesus knew this. Jesus was tapped into this, and that's why it's good news. And it's not that he leaves us with nothing to do, but rather, he helps us to see that before we do anything, we can acknowledge in ways that are healthy that yes, we make mistakes, Yes, we sin, but yes, there's a God who loves us, and today is another day, a new day, and so help us to step into the light of your love, to hear this teaching of Jesus, this parable, and to get over <laughs> the Pharisee and the tax collector, and rather to hear Jesus' words as they are addressed to us. We pray in his name, amen. Now, I want to share an addendum, a footnote to my sermon, an experience that I had last Sunday night when we were wiping the tables after the soup supper. There's a 6.30 Alcoholics Anonymous meeting that comes in, so we're being chased. We get done at 6, we got to clean up, and they're coming in and making coffee, and we're sort of tripping over each other, and I was in the fellowship hall, and I, th there were several men. It's, it's, uh, the meeting at 6.30 is a men's meeting. There were several men that were setting up chairs and tables, and I, I overheard a conversation that was not being done in secret. They were talking out loud. I did not turn around to see any face, but this is the con conversation I heard. One man said to another man, Hey, it's been a while since I've seen you. And the second man said, I've been drinking. And the first guy said, well, you're here now. And the second man said, yes, and I'm not drinking. What I wanted to do was turn around, run over, and give them both a hug. Because in that instant, 
there was hospitality. I see you. I haven't seen you. I've missed you. I see you. There was confession. I've been drinking. I, I've, <laughs> I haven't lived up to my potential. Theologically, you know, I suppose the guy could say, I've been sinning, except that's so generic. He was specific. He was honest enough to be specific. And this, the first guy then, with a, 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 a sort of an open-armed way, says, you're here now. You're in church now. And the second man said, that's right, and this moment, this moment, I'm not sinning. I'm not drinking. And I thought, that's church. That's the redemptive moment. Now, you know, I don't know if I'd put money on that second guy to not ever drink again, but that's not the point, is it? And so, whatever else I've done so far today and whatever else I'm going to do when I leave here, I, I hope because I'm with you and because I can be honest with you and because you'd see right through me anyway because a lot of you know me, <laughs> maybe in just this, for this instant, maybe we're knowing God's mercy, experiencing grace in the most profound, deepest way. We're welcome here. It's good that we're here. And I'm grateful. Make sure I'm pronouncing this name. Pray for Calicia. Is that correct, Calicia? That she might find peace and feel God's blessings. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for Phil and Cindy, who are dealing with serious illness in their family. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for those persons this past week who were affirmed by the Board of Ordained Ministry, who will be ordained at our annual conference in June, for God's Spirit to continue to speak to them and through them, that the light of Christ would shine upon them and upon others because of their ministry. Lord, in your mercy. We pray for our staff parish relations committee, for all the work that they have done, for all the work still to do, as they and this congregation discern with our district superintendent and our bishop um, who will be called to be the pastor of this place next July. Lord, in your mercy. For our children, for the joy they bring to us, for how they remind us of the light of God, how they can be loving and generous, a prayer of gratitude for them. Lord, in your mercy. And for those charged with parenting or grandparenting, for each of us in this congregation and the children who are part of our ministry here, that we would be wise in how we live our lives before them and in how we teach them the good news, the grace of Christ, and the love of God for them. Lord, in your mercy. For our friends who are worshiping at this hour in our chapel, our Nepalese and Bhutanese sisters and brothers, uh, on this first day of their worship, 
in close proximity to us. May your spirit bless them. May their worship bring them hope and comfort and healing and peace. And may it empower them to be light in our community. Lord, in your mercy. For the ministries of our church, some which we are aware of for our thrift shop, for the supper, for the way in which our congregation opens this place to um, so many who come looking for hope and for wholeness and for encouragement. Um, we pray that the light of Jesus would shine through all of those ministries, the ones we're aware of and the ones, the so many that are done without our being aware of it. Lord, in your mercy. God, if we could hear the murmurings now, the silent prayers that are being prayed in the hearts and minds and souls of this congregation, it would be like incense that rises up to you. We pray these prayers with humility. We pray them with faith. And we pray them from a place of gratitude for life's many blessings. All is not as it should be in our world. As we are aware of that and prayerful about that, help us to see what is not as it should be within our own souls. And knowing that you love us. Give us courage to step out in faith, to take the risks we need to take, to become every day more and more like the people that you hope we will be, that we are called to be. We're grateful that we can lift our prayers up to you, all of us, confident that you listen and that we can pray aloud words that Jesus taught us. So we say, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power glory forever. Amen. We're going to give our gifts and our tithes uh, that are used to support the ministry of our parish, and as we do so, we're going to sing a hymn, and I got to say, I don't think I've ever sung this one before. It's, it's short. We're going to repeat it. It's number 2215, 2215, in the small black hymnal, the faith we sing. I'll play through it once for us, and then we'll sing it twice through together as um, we give our gifts and our tithes. Let's sing together.
God, thank you for many gifts, for treasures entrusted to us, for all the blessings, the ones we're keenly aware of and the ones that uh, we take for granted. Thank you for the opportunities we have to share, to give, to take the I out of the equation and to consider the we, the us, the other. Thank you for the story we've heard this morning. Let it take root in our own lives as we ponder the tax collector and the Pharisee. Help us to see the story is for us. May the gifts we give today enable us as a congregation to be generous in our community, to be a light for others. Thank you for all who give, for the work that you call us to do. We're grateful, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. I have announcements which I've written down. Yeah. Scott wants me to remind the men that this coming Saturday at Denny's at 7.30, between 7.30 and 8, there's a breakfast. Faith United Methodist Church men gather there, and we are invited to welcome them. So that's this coming Saturday. Our Staff Parish Relations Committee. Um, we had talked last week about the possibility of someone from Staff Parish sharing with us about the, one of those posters on the back. I'm not sure if anybody's prepared to do that. It would be really fun to hear what all you had in mind when you did that. So next week, um, I will send a note to our staff parish chair and say, come, ready to do that so that we can see what that means. I believe we have an announcement from Dina. And Dina, I'm going to ask you to You're, I'm going to need, you can grab that and just grab it right out of there if you need to. Perfect. Okay, so uh, as many of you know, I'm a student at Rice High School, and uh, this, this next Sunday we have an open house, uh, and Rice has been a really excellent fit for me. Uh, they offer the rigor of college prep coursework with the support of a close-knit faith community. If you believe that you or your grandchild, like your grandchild or your child will benefit from a Christian high school experience, I encourage you to attend the open house next Sunday at Rice from 1 to 3 p.m. And if you have any questions, uh, I'm happy to speak with people after church uh, if you're interested. Thank you. Don't leave. <laughs> what year are you, Dina? Uh, I'm a junior. She's a junior. How's it going? Good. <laughs> What's the toughest course? Um, well, I think chem. Chemistry. Yeah. I almost flunked it. My dad, when I was at Rice, my dad said, son, we got to pass it. My dad said, we have to pass this course so you never have to take it again. That's what my dad <laughs> said about my chemistry experience. So um, it's a tough course. Who's the teacher? Uh, Mr. Mazzella. Are they fair? Yeah, he, he actually is a good teacher. I just, I get confused by some things. Yeah. You get confused by some things? Yeah. Okay. You doing Algebra 2 this year, or did you do that last year? Uh, I did that last year. I'm doing Geometry. Oh, Geometry. Yeah, they like switched it. Yes, they did. You used to have to take Geometry first. Geometry is a piece of cake, yeah. don't you think? It's a lot of angles. A lot of <laughs> angles. Yes, right. <laughs> Dina, learn the angles. You've got to learn the angles in life. Okay, all right. Um, are you going to pass your junior year? Uh, yeah. <laughs> okay, good. Thank you, Dina. <laughs> it was a treat for me last year. Um, Dina's sister, Abby, also was at Rice. She was a senior last year, and I got asked to come and play the piano for their stunt night class. It had been a long time since I'd been in the halls of Rice Memorial High School. It was great fun for me to, to do that. So anyway, thank you for that. Um, I want to share... We're starting to get more serious because it's getting closer about this December um, 6th through 8th celebration. And so we have the first run of cards that um, have the image of Jesus of the people and the information on the back. And um, I'm going to, I mean, there's many more that we can make, but I'm, I wasn't going to do this, but I am. I'm going to just leave these in the back 
for, the, for them to be looked at. Scott, would you mind just taking these and maybe put them on the table back there with the, and feel free to take them. Don't, I mean, we, we can make plenty more. Thank you. Um, we'll also be putting up flyers that look like this. And we also um, will be making bulletin inserts that we'll send around. So this, this program got some play this past week at Board of Ordained Ministry. We, as part of the, the training that we do for anti-racism, we saw a video called The Divine Journey. And I'll post that. I'll have, um, maybe next week, I'll put that in the chimes or maybe the, the link also in our bulletin so that you can see it. The story of Janet McKenzie, her artwork, um, it's, it's a wonderful piece. So several of you have signed up and willing to be volunteers for this. We will be uh, looking for more people. And this is December 6th, 7th, and 8th, celebration of this award-winning image, Jesus of the People. And Scott, would you come down one more time? Let's put these back there as well in case you want to take them. You don't have to take them, but I'm just, they're just there. And if you know places that um, you might want to hang them up, we'll be... Oh, good idea. Yes, will you do that? Good. Okay. All right. Then um, I think that was... Next week is All Saints. Um, this week is Halloween, All Hallows' Eve. It's our tradition, the first Sunday after... Halloween, um, we, we invite people to remember those who have gone before us in your family, loved ones. Bring a flower. Uh, they will be arranged, and we'll take a moment and remember uh, the people who have been special to us in our lives. Um, and so that's for next Sunday. Adam has an announcement. Come make it. I think um, when, you, when you are finished, no. I don't have anything else, so you'll well, announce the you, closing hymn. Did, did you announce that it's church cleanup day on Saturday? I, I didn't. Isn't it church cleanup day on Saturday? It is. It's church cleanup day on Saturday, right? It is. So come and clean up the church or something. I don't know all the information, but I know that that's happening. And make sure you let jo June speak as well. Oh, June. And sign prayer letters. How did I do? I'm not. <clears throat> uh, make sure to sign the prayer letters in the back. It's church cleanup day. June has something. Uh, I, Justin has something. I have uh, one thing to say, uh, sort of two things, it's one thing. Uh, the 30 slash 12 hour fast is this weekend for uh, Ripolites. So uh, on Friday night, our high schoolers are invited to come at five o'clock and we're gonna sleep over and not eat together and talk about why we might do that and who in the world doesn't have the option to eat. And uh, then we'll break our fast at seven o'clock on Saturday evening. The fifth through eighth graders are going to be coming in, or invited to come in at seven o'clock in the morning. We're gonna ha have breakfast together, and then we're going to not eat lunch, and then we're gonna have a big dinner at seven o'clock. So if you have questions about that, uh, just come let me know, and I'd be happy to, to talk through that, because it's sort of a new thing, especially for the fifth through eighth graders. And certainly people are, have asked, well, but I've got this, you're welcome to pop out and pop in if you'd like, just don't eat anything while you're out. And June, and then Justin, yes? This is a last minute thing, but I have two more of these books to give out. It's uh, the Vermont Reads uh, book for this year, and it's a discussion with the UMW group. Anybody is invited to partake of it. And come and join us. And the other thing I'd like to say is that my shoulder is getting better. I couldn't have the knitting group, um, the knitting sale. And so I'm planning as it is now to have it two weeks from today. So thank you very much. And finally, um, I was asked to be the coordinator for ushers. So my name is Justin. I would like to coordinate those of you who want to usher. Um, we're gonna do things a little differently in that we're not gonna have month-long commitments. It's gonna be just a sign up for the week you would like to do it. Uh, Mark has asked that we, we really only need two. Uh, so hopefully that lightens the burden as well. Uh, I have a, something of a job description, but essentially uh, pretty straightforward. Should be able to take part in, in worship and also be able to help your 
fellow um, parishioners. So if you're interested in signing up, there'll be a link that goes out in the chimes. And we're going to be do using the Sign Up Genius um, web platform. But if people don't have access to that, I can um, you know, help fill in the blanks and, and be the, the, the helper as well as the administrator. So reach out to me. I'll stick around after church. Um, I did get a sign-up list when I wasn't here a couple weeks ago. But if there are more people who aren't on that list and would be willing to sign up, please come and, uh, and speak with me. Thanks. Final hymn. Here we go. I got the microphone. Uh, here I am, Lord, 593. Thank you.
know what this is? Do you know what the announcement is? There's bread downstairs, free. Help yourself. What a great gift to be together. Thank you for singing. What a blessing. It's, it's a blessing when people come together, when young people make announcements and they're hanging on in chemistry class. What a blessing. What a great gift to be together. I mean, you know, we don't take it for granted. And so let's ask for God's blessing. He's, God has brought us together. Let's pray that God's going to be with us as we head out into the world. Bless these folks. Bless us all, we pray, God, because we need it, <laughs> because we depend on it. And help us to be grateful for it when it comes our way. And so for the work that awaits us within our own families, our own relationships, in the world around us, in our jobs, in our schools, bless us for what it is we need to be doing. Keep us humble, hopeful. Give us strength, courage. Surround us with people who pray for us, work with us, and love us. For all that awaits us this week, we ask your blessing. And we pray in the name of the God who created us, the Christ who redeems us, the Spirit who sustains us. Amen. Amen. Brothers and sisters, the peace of Christ be with you. Let's greet each other.